seeds that would come, the abundance of rains that would come that would spring up fresh in life. The Lord instructed me for Saturday night to be an open worship. We don't know exactly how it will go, but the Lord's Supper will be prepared to worship in that fashion. He even said, tell people if they want to come in and worship in giving, let them do that. Every way that the Lord directs of the Holy Spirit, come and worship, come and seek the face of the Lord. But come with a celebratory heart. Amen? Come with a heart that's ready to celebrate the season that God has revealed to us. The abundance of ranks. Pastor, what does all that mean? I don't know exactly what it means to you individually, corporately. I don't know. He didn't give me the details. I can't tell you if you do this, you'll get this, or you'll do this, and you'll get that. I don't have any instructions like that from the Lord. He just showed me that it's the season of Shabbat, and it's the ending of the winter season for His people. And it's the time that the rains begin to come once again and fresh new life springs forth. He said, come celebrate that I'm announcing that over my people now. So Saturday night at 630, please be a part of that. Invite someone to be a part of that. You say, well, they don't go to church here. They go to another church. It's okay. Let them come. If the Lord really, you know, pushes them forward to be in the house, let them be here. Let them celebrate. And we will let them know when they get here what it's about. So that they also can join in as the people of God and enjoy and walk in what God has for us going forward. So be a part of that Saturday night, 630, if at all possible. Go with me to 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 29. Some instruction of the Lord that we need to look at uh, as we go forward. I love the Lord because there's a lot of times that um, I was on pathway to make a mistake. And God said, <clears throat> and turn me a different way. I've seen that multiple times in my life, only to look back and say, what was that turnabout? He said, I was keeping you. I was keeping you. So tonight I feel like this is an instruction of understanding that we need to really take a hold of. Because if we do not, we will make mistakes going ahead. So let's look at this. 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 29, a jumping off spot, and we'll... We'll see how the Holy Spirit ties it all together. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice. Still dealing with the house of Saul. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instruction and the Lord's command, for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. But now please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you since you have rejected the Lord's command. He has rejected you as king of Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back. And tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. And who he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. Continuing now in verse 30. Then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned. Because you need to get this right here. He said, I know I have sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. That was a form of repentance, but it was extremely empty. We'll look at that. So Samuel finally agreed and went back with him and saw worship the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring King Agag to me. Agag arrived full of hope for he thought surely the worst is over and I've been spared. But Samuel said, as your sword has killed the sons of many mothers, now your mother will be childless. And Samuel cut Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel went home to Ramah and Saul returned to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. And the Lord was sorry he had ever made Saul king of Israel. The title of the message tonight that we have to understand and get a full leading of Holy Spirit in is true. Emerge 2021, true repentance. True repentance, okay? 
Father, lead us now. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Only you can bring all this together. Lord, and pierce our hearts tonight that we might understand fully what you're trying to reveal. That we might move in your word. It's not just a word, but we need to move in it and apply it as all your word is. Lead us now, Holy Spirit, not man's agenda, but yours alone in Jesus' name. Amen. Repentance is simply defined to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. But if you actually leave it just there, you're in trouble. Because unless true repentance takes place, you're destined to repeat the same avenues that got you to the place in, for the need of repentance in the first place. Does that make sense? Amen. So true repentance in its fullness, for, in order for repentance to not be an empty thing that just feels or expresses sincere regret, but you actually must turn. True repentance involves turning away from the sin. Turning away from the things that brought you to the moment of feeling an expression of sincere regret or remorse. So understand that's what repentance is. An empty repentance is just an expression or a saying or maybe even an omission. And I've seen this so, so often times. There was a time and a season several years ago and KG joined with me I think a couple of times and there was a Tri-Cities prayer meeting prayer group meeting and we would go from time to time to different churches and really a lot of ministers and elders of churches would gather and we went I, I got to see all kind of different churches in the Tri-City prayer group meetings and gatherings and I believe they were the Lord but oftentimes I heard ministers in the house Say this, oh, it starts with me. Oh, how I need to have this going on and that going on. Oh, I repent before God. Judgment begins in the house of God. Oh, how it begins with me. I heard that empty repentance time and time again in those meetings. I really did. Because we can express and admit and we can say all of these things and other remorse that is before us or in our hearts because of the way things are going and the way things are happening and we can kind of ease the soul, ease the spirit, if you will, on the inside and say, oh, it begins with me. And it makes us kind of look good before the people too, doesn't it? Oh, when the pastor gets up and says, oh, it begins with him and he needs to repent. It kind of makes you look and feel good before. Oh, he, he's, he's really getting with it. I've seen that time and time again in the church, but yet nothing changed. I've seen that time and time again from leadership in the church, yet they never turn a different direction. They go right back to the systematic failures that brought them to the place of where the church is right now. And see, that was the problem with Saul. And we're going to see what God does when he comes to truly restore an individual tonight as we go forward. But it begins with true, true, true repentance. All right, let's look at a little bit in the history of things to see what was going on a little bit. Let's see how the Lord ties all this together. Go with me to 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 17 and verse 22. You've got to, you've got to get a little bit of this too. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels, the word says. The sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork. While the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever it brought up be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar. He would demand raw meat before it had been boiled so that it could be used for roasting. The man offering the sacrifice might reply, take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. Let's not violate everything. Then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now or I'll take it by force. So the sin of these young men was very serious. And I really want to stop there and let you know, and you're going to see how the Lord revealed to me how serious God is right now. 
He said the sin of these young men was very serious. Get that. Serious in the Lord's sight. What's going on in our nation and all across the world, it lies at the doorsteps of the church. The most powerful entity that has ever been birthed in the earth is the church of the living God. It lies at our doorsteps. So the sin of these young men were very serious in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. They found it in their position that they could, again, we see this continually again that happens in the failure of leadership under the call of God and the anointing of God. What happens? They found out that they could get rich. They found out that they could get stuff. They could demand that these things come to them and nobody could rebuttal it because they were the leadership. I'm telling you, either leadership, listen to me, either leadership of the church tonight will repent or they will be removed. It's already beginning to happen. Verse 22, the same old stuff. Now, Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were what? Seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Does anything look familiar? The same old song and dance. When people of God get into leadership and begin to, to find out that they can, they can get stuff and they can begin to... You know, it's the same big three that I was always told about as a young man. Pride, women, and money. These are the big three. If you want to see what gets ministers of the gospel out of the pulpit, and I'm talking about men, and I know there's women that minister as well, so you can take it both ways, but I'm, I'm reflecting on my walk. The big three. That's what I note them as. The big three. Pride, women, and money. You better stay away from those areas because those are the things that God reveals not only in His Word, but I have seen over and over and over in nearly 40 years of living, that's what gets men of God removed from pulpits. Period. These things are still going on. Men and women are still falling prey. To these temptations, the enemy, listen to me, we have no excuse. For the enemy's plan was not only revealed to us in God's word, we've got the playbook. I never will forget teaching a second grade class at Noel school and I was teaching them. I said, look, you've got the playbook. You know what he's going to do. You know how to recognize it when it comes. It's, I mean, you are set up for the ultimate success, not only in your flesh, no, because it's the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit that will give you triumph in all things, but you do have the playbook. Amen. Amen. Nothing's new under the sun, right? You've got the playbook. There really is no excuse for any of us. And we're all ministers of, of the gospel. We're all of the priesthood of believers. There's no excuse for any of us to see the name of God take such a hit because we fail in these areas. He's revealed to us over and over and over. What was going on? Does it sound familiar? <laughs> it looks like we're walking in those days again. Go with me now to 1 Samuel 4, 1 and 3, through 6 through 11. So this was going on before this battle. You understand that that was 1 Samuel 2. And if we go in the order of things, of the word, now we're in 1 Samuel 4. So now we understand that there's something going on pre this battle. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? They didn't need to ask. They knew the sins that were going on. They knew the history. If there's sin in the camp. <laughs> Amen. God allowed defeat. Why were they? We don't understand why we're getting beat. <laughs> why we're getting defeated by our enemies. 
It's because in the leadership, it starts with leadership. Come on. Come on. It starts with men and women that are called of God to be a leader. That's where it starts. It's because the leadership were seducing young women and getting wealthy off the people of God. Does it sound familiar? Don't make me go back to the $14 million mansions. I think we've beat that one to death, haven't we? Why were we defeated? Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated? Then they said, <laughs> they didn't pause to say maybe we need to repent. Maybe we need to think about what's going on. Maybe we need to look at ourselves and See what's wrong before our God because our God doesn't lose. That's right. So if our God doesn't lose, then therefore there must be something wrong with us. Come on. But they didn't do that. They said, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated? Then they said, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant. God's about to get serious. Let's bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. There's no way God is going to. There's no way God is going to allow His presence in His name to be defeated. That's right. Amen. See, listen to me now. This is what they thought, <laughs> but God knows better. There's, this is what they were thinking. They didn't look at their mistakes. They didn't look at their failures. They didn't look at the possibility of something being wrong with them. They said, come on somebody. There's no way my denomination will fail. Mm, come on. They said, there's no way. Look, we've got $15 million in the bank and a mega church. This thing ain't going away. You better get behind a rock and hide if you're not repenting before the Lord because it will go away. Does anybody get it? They said, there is no way that the ark of God will lose. What happened? What happened? They bring the ark of the... Let's go and bring the ark of the covenant from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemy. What's going on, the Philistines ask? What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp when they were told it was... With my God. Now, I believe the Philistines knew more about the God of Israel right here than the people of God did. I mean, come on. This is getting ridiculous. I believe that's going on in the house of the Lord today. My God, there's, pe there's people on the outside looking in that know Amen. more about the God that we serve. Because you preach any truth in the pulpit anymore, it offends, it offends somebody. You know, you can't, you can't. Lord help us. Here we go. <laughs> what's going on, the Philistines? That's what's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp. When they were told it was because the ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. They knew the history. The children of Israel forgot their old history and couldn't figure out why they were being defeated. But the Philistines sure knew the history. The gods have come into their camp. They cried, this is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help! <laughs> Who can save us from the mighty gods of Israel? They are the, listen, they knew the history. They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. They knew the history. I mean, this, guy, this God, He does not lose. So they said, boys, you better fight as never before. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slave just sure as the world. Just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines, Philistines fought desperately and Israel was defeated again. Now wait a minute. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The, the survivors turned and fled to their tents. The ark of God was captured and Hophni and Phinehas, those scoundrels... The Bible calls them the two sons of Eli were killed. I got to make an announcement tonight. Your mega, your denomination, your, your history of no way it can fail. 
you better repent before the Lord. Because the children of Israel said, we know what we'll do. We'll just trust in it. Yeah, trust in the Lord. No doubt about it. Amen? But listen to me. As long as there's sin in the camp, and as long as people are operating according to the ways of the house of Saul, then come on. You, you, can, you can decree and declare and, and, and do all kind of stuff you ever thought. You can think you're speaking in the most heavenly language you ever thought of. But when there's sin in there, man, you better watch out. Because <laughs> you'll still get defeated. Is that not the truth tonight? You don't have to take my word for it. The ark of the, the presence of God that was, that was to be known in the holy of holies, only to be moved when the tabernacle of God was moved. The presence of God that if men knew they touched it, they would die. It had come into the camp, but yet the people of God were still defeated. Why? Because it was in the leadership of the people of God that they were getting wealthy off the people of God and they were seducing young men, excuse me, seducing young women at the door of the tabernacle. God's not going to allow that stuff to go on and give you victory. Sorry, God don't work that way. My God, that's like me taking my daughter and letting her do whatever and still covering her with victory knowing that the pathway that she's on is on the way to hell. Sometime, my God, don't touch the stove, Noel. Don't touch the stove, Noel. Don't touch the stove, Noel. You tell her time and time and time again. Someday she's going to have to touch that thing on her own. Get burnt and understand that what Father God has been telling her all along. Quit touching the stove. My God, somebody help me preach this thing tonight. I come to teach, but I'm getting wound up. I'll, I'll try to calm down. We got to get this. You see, we think that we've gotten too big to fail, man. We think that our mecca has gotten too big to fail, that our denominations have gotten too big to fail, that, that our heroes over the last 25 years, they're too big to fail. Listen to me. Unless there's true repentance in the house and not an empty one, unless there's true repentance in the house, watch out. The people of God were still defeated. How serious is God? What did He say in the passage of Scripture that we were looking at? He said, God looked at the sin of Hophni and Phinehas and said, they were very serious. We identify those sins of getting rich off the people of God and being involved in sexual immorality in the church. How do you get to the place, listen to me, the big three is still true today. How do you get to the place that you feel like you can get rich off the people of God and you can commit adultery while you're leading the people of the house of God? How do you get there? You, the, the sin of pride wraps you so greatly that you think there ain't no way we can fail. We've gotten too big. Come on. The people of God thought that they could bring the Ark of the Covenant in the camp and still have victory. But unless there's true repentance, even the Ark of God was captured and Hophni and Phinehas, part of their leadership, was killed. Right? Okay, let's move on. How serious is God? The Lord spoke to my heart in prayer this week. And He simply said, Jeremiah 7, Look with me here in verse 1. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, Go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and give this message to the people. O Judah, listen to this message from the Lord. Listen to it, all of you who worship here. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. I'm speaking now to the church. Come on. Under the unction of Holy Spirit, according to His Word, I'm not just speaking to this call. I'm speaking to the church right now. Listen. If you will, God is merciful and God is gracious. If you will quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. Listen. 
listen to me. Denominations, listen to me. Uh, Non-denominations, listen to me. Evangelic ministries, listen to me. Prophetic ministries, listen to me. Listen to me. If you will quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here, they chant. They chant the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. What was the same thing that happened? What was the same thing that we just read about? There's no way we can lose to these Philistines if we get the ark of God back in the camp. Go bring the ark. There's no way we can lose. What was saying right here of the prophet Jeremiah, don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. But I will be merciful. Oh my God, listen to me now. God is speaking to the church of the living God. I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Lord have mercy. God is interested in justice even in the house of the Lord. Come on somebody. You're getting wealthy off the people of God while the people of God can't feed their kids and can't pay their mortgage. It's time for some justice to come back into the house. He's interested in that. He says, I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. He's talking to the people of God. He's not talking. Come on, somebody. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's not talking to people that don't know the Lord. He's talking to us. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners and orphans and widows. Only if you stop murdering. You're murdering. And only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave to your ancestors to keep forever. House of Saul. Davidic restoration. Everybody in the middle. Listen to this this hour. Don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think you can stick? My goodness. I wish the leadership of the church and the house of Saul on the bridge in the Davidic restoration. I wish us all would come together and listen tonight. Do you really think that you can still murder, commit adultery, lie, and burn incense to Baal and all those other new gods of yours? And then come here and stand before me in my temple and chant, we are safe. This is very serious of the Lord. Only to go right back to all those evils again? Don't you yourselves admit that this temple which bears my name. You just call it like it is, ain't it? This temple which bears my name. They know the truth. Listen to me. If you're hearing this tonight and this is piercing your heart. You already know the truth that his temple has become a den of thieves. Surely I will see all the evil going on there. The Lord has spoken. This is how serious he is. Listen to me. Either re true repentance comes unto the leadership of every ministerial outreach of the church of the living God. Or that leadership will be moved because he is now raising up an authentic way after his own heart. And he's been preparing it for some time. But listen to me. He said in the entire journey, he said, don't forget the house of Saul. He said, when you get an opportunity for restoration, restore the house of Saul. When you get an opportunity, bless the house of Saul. But I'm telling you, he's sounding the alarm of the last call to the house of Saul. Listen, Saul, if you want to stay, you've got to repent. Listen, leadership. Repent and become part of the remnant restoration of true worship in spirit and in truth. Repent. Do you think he was going to let it go on forever? This is the last call, I believe. God is ready to move. True repentance of the ways of the house of Saul must happen to survive forward. Look back. Go back with me, Ron. This is what the Holy Spirit is speaking. True repentance of the ways of the house of Saul must happen to survive forward. How serious do you think it is, Pastor? I believe it's extremely serious. I, I, I'm beginning to feel that 
that if, if true repentance doesn't take place, that God's fixing to remove some stuff. First Samuel 15. What's the problem with leadership in the church that we've touched on already? What's the problem with the leadership of the church? They're able to admit. They're able to, to, to feel that remorse. But they're having a very big difficulty from, from breaking away from the systematic failures that got them there in the first place. They go right back. I told you about the ministers' meetings that I was a part of for nearly a year in that. And every meeting, oh, it begins with me, Lord. Everybody would start feeling, oh, I feel better about that after that. But when they would leave the altars of those meetings, they would not change their ways. It's an empty repentance. This is what happened with Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 30-35. Then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people. And before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Now, I don't even know, I'm, I'm not even going to dig into that one. He, he, he doesn't say the Lord our God at that point. He says the Lord your God. I'm not going to even go there. That's between him and the Lord. Touch not the Lord's anointed. Amen. <laughs> so Samuel finally agreed and went back with him and saw worship the Lord. What happened? What was he worried about? And what is it that leadership, even when they get called, or even, even when they're in the darkness and the Lord just wants to call them out. It's an empty, please honor me before the people. Just, just let's say face. Let's see. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to save face right now. It's an empty repentance. They're saying, oh, I know I've sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people. That's an empty repentance right there. That's not a true repentance before the Lord. What is that shows that's still in his heart and his mind? I still want to look like the king to the people. There was another repentance that took place in the house of David that says, please remove not thy spirit from me, oh God. Amen. Amen. But this was an empty repentance. And this is what has been a failure in the house of God for some time now. What is he speaking tonight? True repentance. Is this coming to our steps tonight? You better believe it. Let's look on a little bit further. Go with me one more slide. Mama. Here we go. Here is true repentance. True transformation and the authentic path of God forward. Then Saul, still breathing threats. Don't you love how Holy Spirit works? Who do we just talk about that demonstrated to us a biblical model of empty repentance? Who was it? Saul. But then on the flip side, as we enter into the new covenant of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we see another Saul that comes to a place. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what would you have me to do? The heart of true repentance is this. When the Lord comes to the moment of revelation to your life, and begins to reveal to you the need, the need of true repentance. This is the response. <laughs> Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? Right, Period. What are you saying, Lord? And what shall I do? See, empty repentance is just a confession of the remorse and guilt. But true repentance is actually getting up and turning from the sinful ways and walking in the ways of the Lord. Amen. This is 
what is being demonstrated in biblical model through a truth. You see, I do not believe that King Saul of the Old Testament had a true transformation in that moment. But I absolutely believe that Saul, who would become Paul, had a true transformation in this moment. True repentance took place. True transformation took place. And the authentic path of God forward was displayed. What happened with King Saul? He continued to try to operate in his own ways after the fact. And he was an utter failure. Matter of fact, he too came to the place. This is what happened with Saul. Jesus had been preached. Jesus had been crucified. Had he not? Jesus was already alive and well. And the gospel was going forward. And Saul who would become Paul, tried to continue in the ways of the old covenant. He tried to continue, and it was an utter failure. What happened with King Saul? He did the same thing. He tried to continue in his own ways of the house of Saul, and it was an utter failure. But what happened right here? There was a true transformation that took place. We'll look at it more in detail. But what happened right here? Paul was transformed and God began to put an authentic path forward in his life. Saul, King Saul never found it because he even went and consulted a witch. But the apostle Paul was anointed of God. And when the Holy Spirit said go here, he went here. And when he went here, and he went here. And when a snake got on his arm, he slung it off. And when people come against him and put him in jail, he was healed. He was restored. And even on house arrest, he preached the gospel of Jesus. The authentic path of God was revealed forward. All right, let's look a little bit further. Come on. Now, where does this apply to us right now? What, do we, what have we been teaching? Not us, not man, but Holy Spirit. And I'll address that in a minute. What has the Holy Spirit been teaching he said, you go announce that the house of Saul was coming to an end. That he was restoring Davidic leadership of restoration of true worship in spirit and in truth. He said, when they come assembled, what you will do, what you do beyond establishment, what will you do? You will go and retrieve the presence. Amen. We're coming in to the completion of establishment. I believe that the remnant is right now. What's next? His glory is coming, Amen. not in a visitation, but a settling down once again where it absolutely belongs. What happened after everything was established and Davidic restoration came forth and the authentic way after God's own heart? What did David do? He said, everybody get in your place. We're going after the presence of God that has been neglected for the last 20 years in the house of Saul. Now here's what we've got to get. Now listen right here. Here's the meat of the matter. What, how does this apply to us? We've talked about repentance. We've talked about what true repentance looks like. What true transformation looks like. How does it apply to our step in this very moment? Look right here. Look what happened in 1 Samuel. Thank you, brother. What happened in 1 Samuel 6, 10 through 16, 19 through 20? Get this. We're about done. So these instructions were carried out. What happened? The Ark of the Covenant gets taken. You want to have a, just a good glory laugh? Go to the Temple of Dagon and watch that, watch that statue just fall down before the presence of God. I won't laugh at the plagues that came upon the people, but I do like, I do like to see that, that, that statue fall. And then they set it back up and it falls again and his arms and everything broke off. I like that, don't you? That makes me feel good. Yes, God, do it. You know, it, I, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, <laughs> but what well, we do against that kind of stuff, you know what I'm saying? Here we go. <laughs> so these instructions were carried out. What happened? The Ark of the Covenant was taken. It was taken into the land of the Philistines. Plagues come, tumors, plagues. They, they, they smart enough to say, man, something ain't right. We're going to figure out if this is Israel God or if this is coincidence, but we got we got to figure this thing out. You know, I wish the people of our country could figure that out. Amen. Is this coincidence or is this God? I wish we could figure out God has been calling to us for some time. Help us. So then they decide they're going to put the Ark of the Covenant of God on a cart 
and send it on its way to figure out what's going on. So that's where we're at right here. So these instructions were carried out. Two cows were hitched to the cart. And their newborn cows were shut up in a pen. Then the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors were placed on the cart. Help us, Holy Ghost. And sure enough, without very often in other directions, the cows went straight along the road toward Beth Shemesh, lowing as they went. The Philistine rulers followed them as far as the border. Verse 13. The people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley, and when they saw the ark, they were overjoyed. The cart came into the field of a man named Joshua and stopped beside a large rock. So the people broke up the wood of the cart for a fire, killed the cows, sacrificed them to the Lord as a burnt offering. They had church. Several men of the tribe of Levi lifted the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors from the cart and placed them on the large rock. Many sacrifices and burnt offerings were offered to the Lord that day by the people. The five Philistine rulers watched all this and returned to Ekron that same day. But what happened in verse 19? See, this is, you've got to get this now. What happened? But the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh because they looked. They looked into the ark of the Lord and the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand here in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? They cried out, where can we send the ark from here? This is a lesson. And I'm going to tell you somebody that knew this lesson. This happened well before that David went to retrieve the ark of the Lord. David had no excuse to be angry at God when somebody got killed for touching the ark. He had no excuse. You say, you know the specific instruction that the priests were to carry the ark. That's why some poles and some rings were put there that they were to carry. And so it should have, David knew that it should have never been on a cart. He knows that for sure. But he had no reason to get angry when Uzzah was killed when he touched the ark. He even knew this history right here. That 70 men were killed. He already knew this. Look right here. 1 Chronicles 13, 1 through 3. David consulted with all his officials, including the generals, captains of his army. Then he addressed the entire assembly of Israel as follows. If you approve it, if you approve, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send messages to all the Israelites throughout the land, including the priests and Levites in their towns and pasture lands. Let us invite them to come and join us. It is time to bring back the ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. David knew that it shouldn't have been on a cart. David knew that men had already been killed. Mm -hmm. David also knew that pagan gods, that's how they moved their stuff. How did how, the Philistines, what did they decide to do? We know how to move the things of gods. We put them on a cart, put up some, put up some, come on. Come on, come on what has God been saying about the house of Saul? He's been showing us they have been stubborn. They have rebelled. They say they know how to do it better than me. They know how. That's why the house of Saul is in. We know how to have church. We know how to have a program. We know how to build a congregation. We know how to get tails in seats. We know how to tell them what they want to hear. We know how to build fire. Yeah, keep saying it. Keep saying you know how to do it. <sighs> David knew better. Yes, there has been neglect of his presence in the house of Saul. We can, we can absolutely agree over the last 20 years. God took me to Brownsville. I'm not going to tell you the story, but what did he tell me at Brownsville? He revealed to me at Brownsville a year and a half ago. He said, I'm coming in my glory in your generation again. Do not touch my glory. He said the men at Brownsville began to try to figure out what they were going to do with my glory. And when they touched it, I left. He said, I'm going to do it again in your generation. Do not touch my glory. This instruction of the Lord. David knew somebody, nobody was. But what did David do? What is this representative to us tonight? He continued in a way of the house of Saul. Just a little thing. Well, you don't know how the Lord spoke to me today over the last several days. I'll tell you here in a second. This is just a little thing. It was just put on a cart. 
They were just trying to bring the, the, the presence of God to its rightful place. To the center point of the people of God again. Yes, there's been neglect. Yes, he is calling upon the remnant to usher in once more his presence. But again, he's saying tonight. And this is what we're going to get to in a place called repentance. He says this, but in no way are the ways of the house of Saul to be used, period. End of story, guys. Get delivered from it. Get delivered from it. Pastor, get delivered from it. Well, it's got to be this certain way of worship or it's got to be this way or we can't do it with this way. Man, you better get delivered from it. Because the remnant doesn't move, but yet to the voice of God and His Word alone. Amen. 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 You know this, I'm, I'm reviewing now. But he says this, but in no way are the ways of the house of Saul to be used. David knew better. Amen. David knew better. He had no reason to get upset. What happened here in 1 Chronicles 13? David knew better. The whole assembly agreed to this for the people could see that it was the right thing to do. We can see that it's the right thing to do to us. God uses, God melt us, mold us, fill us, use us any way you need to. To usher in your presence at the center point of where it belongs again. The whole assembly agreed that it was the right thing. We agreed that that's the right thing. So David summoned all Israel. From the Shehar brook of Egypt in the south all the way to the town of Lebo Hamath in the north to join in bringing the ark of God from Kiriath Jerem. Then David and all Israel went to Baal of Judah to bring back the ark of God which bears the name of the Lord who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the ark of God. He knew better. They placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house. Uzzah and Ahiah were guiding the cart. David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might. See, see we, can, we can get into everything, man. Celebrating before God with all their might. See, you can have the, you can go and try to get the Ark of the Covenant in the camp, but if there's not true repentance and, and it's not an authentic way, you'll still fail. Come on. David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyrics, harps, tambourines, cymbals, and trumpets. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out his hand. It's just a little thing. To study the ark, the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah and he struck him dead because he had laid his hand on the ark. So Uzzah died there in the presence of God. David knew better. God is giving us opportunity right now in a threshing moment. Listen to me. I do not believe that this is a threshing season. I believe it's a threshing moment. It's time. I don't believe this is something that's going to begin to take place over, over several weeks from now and months and all this stuff. I believe it's a moment that he's saying, let me get even the littlest of the chaff out right now because if I don't, you will make a mistake and it will delay my glory from settling down. What happened? It delayed the glory of God. David knew better. God is giving us opportunity at the threshing floor now before a mistake is made and it delays His glory. And God knows we do not need any more delay. The ark remained where? What happened? David got upset. He had no reason to, but he got upset and the ark remained at Obed-Edom's house for three months. The Lord said now, he said this now. He said, I have brought you to a moment of threshing to get out even the littlest things that might have remained in you from the ways of the house of Saul. I'm fixing to purge it out completely, thresh it out completely. Because when you get to the moment that I've called you to go to and usher in my glory and usher in my presence, that there will be no delay. Does anybody get what the Holy Spirit is saying tonight? What did he call this place? He said, quit trying to be a church, you're a call. 
What did he say about this place? He said it's a call. It's a place where people will become restored, equipped, and launched. Some will stay here and become a part of the call of restoring, equipping, and launching others. Some will launch back out. But that's what the call is. So we know the first step of the call here at this house is a place called restoration. Here's what the Lord wants you to see in restoration. And this is what we must get as we were all birthed and born and even called in the house of Saul. I told somebody that the other day. There was an elder of the house of Saul that texted me after listening to the message this week and was really hard on themselves. I said, look, we were all born. We were all called. We all served in the courts of Saul. I said, but you're coming out with a remnant. Be encouraged. You're an elder that will be part of third anointing. Hallelujah. But here's the model of restoration. So we've all were birthed and called even in the house of Saul. Was Davidic not called in the time? It was, absolutely. It was anointed here in the house of Saul. But he's saying now to us, as a remnant people, he said, you must fully be restored. No ways, no ways, no ways. I had some good times in the house of Saul. Yes, I did. So did you. But none of the ways go. Come on. Listen now. He said this will be an authentic way after God's own heart. That's the only way. Here's what restoration tells. Look at biblical model. We're done. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman who was caught, was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Deliverance. <laughs> then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one. Deliverance. <laughs> Beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Healing. Delivered. This is what the fullness of restoration is. It is deliverance. It is he. God don't just deliver you. He heals you. He makes you whole. Come on, somebody. Not only have you been delivered from the house of Saul, and I know it hurts when you think back and reflect back on all the victories and all the... Tina and I were discussing after church Sunday morning. And you know, one of the failures of the house of Saul was to build monuments to itself. I said, the Lord revealed to me the other day. I said, the first place that I was and I've been filled so many times. But I said, the first time that I've ever experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost was in an altar on the corner of Rock Creek. I said, I can't even go back to my monument. That church ain't even there no more. <laughs> Come on, somebody. It's not even standing anymore. I'm not saying that was a bad place or a bad thing. I have wonderful victories there and wonderful times there. I've already told you my heart. I would have been fourth generation denominational minister of the gospel. I knew my path. I knew what I wanted to do. And what... Man, I grieved for several years. And then one day God healed me. He said, I brought you out. Then he healed me. And now he's been strengthening forward ever since. Come on. Jesus stood up again and said, well, where are your He's already delivered. He says, where are your accusers? He's healing her. You're not condemned anymore. Didn't even one of them condemn Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? He says, neither do I. Homeless. Now he says, now you path forward. I'm going to strengthen you to go and sin no more. That is... You think that's the biblical model of restoration? Yeah, let's look at Acts 9 again. Two slides. Acts 9. Let's, 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 get, let's get another understanding that what restoration is, is a biblical model. Acts 9, 1 through 9, 17 through 20. Then Saul, still breathing out threats, back to Saul. Murders against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if found if anyone in the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, as he journeyed, 
He came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Lord, who, he said, Lord, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goat. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city. He's on his way to make some bad mistakes. God said, I'm going to deliver you from that. I was on my way in my own path and my own thinking. With a genuine heart nonetheless, but in my own path and my own thinking, I was on my way to making some mistakes. And every time I tried to go in a certain direction ministry, when I got out of school, the, the Lord gave me a nauseated feeling in my stomach. And a saint woman of God said, boy, you better not do anything. You better stand and see what the Lord wants. So Saul was delivered in this moment. Was he not? Stop. Boom. Saul was delivered in this moment. And then the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul, this is where a lot of people are coming out of the house of Saul. They have been delivered from it. But they can't fully see right now. They need to be healed. Then Saul arose from the gown, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him in Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something as scales, and he received his sight as once, and he rose and was baptized. So when he received food, and he was what? Strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples of Damascus. Verse 20, immediately he preached, the, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. This is the full model of restoration. What happened with Saul? He was delivered and then he was healed and then God gave him his path forward. That's what's going on. We need to be fully restored. I don't believe that there's major things in the ways of the house of Saul big rocks there anymore but there's some little stones there that will cause us to make some mistakes and add like the oxen stumbled amen I believe that God says this is your call this is what I've kept you for this is your point this is your time in history this is what I've heard the Lord speak to me this is why you were born amen. Hallelujah. this is why you were born he said, but any ways of the house, this is why we must have true repentance even in the house of the remnant. Come on. You think, well, God's pulled us out from a lot of that mess. Listen to me. Don't, th don't start believing your own press. Right. Don't start thinking too highly of yourself more than you ought to. Come on, somebody. Amen. What, what is a good father doing here tonight? He's saying, you better make sure before me to allow me to fully restore you, to deliver, heal, and strengthen you forward. No ways of the house of Saul can go forward. No ways. Listen to me. You want to know how serious God is about this? And I don't want people to take this the wrong way because, I mean, we do it all the time. But this is how serious God is. I do it all the time. People will get up in the pulpit here and they'll talk and they'll reflect on things and the words of the Lord that have come through the house of the Holy Spirit. Now don't, don't, don't take this. I don't want this to hurt nobody's feelings. So just receive the instruction of the Lord because this is just how serious God is. They'll get up in the pulpit. In this call, they'll say, well, Jamie has been saying this. Jamie's been teaching this. The Lord stopped me in prayer this week. He said, put a stop to that in the house. Amen. He said, get your name out of the mix. Come on. Amen. What has been a failing way in the house of Saul? Things have been man-centered and man-led. What did Saul desire in his empty repentance? He said, please make me look good before the people. That wasn't God-centered. That was man-centered. You say... I haven't even got up. And I say, well, so-and-so, I'll be reflecting on something I read or something I run across. I say, Pastor so-and-so said, God said, you better get that word out of your mouth. You better say, Holy Spirit revealed. You better say, God of heaven and earth said. Come on. 
So I don't want you to take that wrong. I said it a bunch, but this is how serious God is. You say, is he that detailed? You better believe it because he knows if there's all kind of praise that begins to come up on this old boy's name, something bad's going to happen. Listen to me. God knows. That's why he said this week, he said, he just took me there, man. I'm just in prayer with the Lord. Just, just dining with him. And he comes and he says, listen, this has been going on in the house. And he says, put a stop to it right now. He said, get your name out of the mix. Thank you. Come on. Because why? What does he know? That if pride begins to squeak in a little bit. What was the big three? Pride? For dudes, pride, women, and money. He knows if things start to creep in, man, we'll go right back down. I ain't trying to circle that mountain again. I'm trying to see that this bride get without spot, without wrinkle, so we can go to glory. And I can say, who's worthy to open up the book? Behold the Lamb. <laughs> Come on, somebody. How much closer we, we'd already been, or maybe we'd already been enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come on. He come, he come over 20 years ago to do repairs to what? His bride. To get her ready. And men touched his glory. And we went right around the mountain again. Let's not do that again. What is God saying to us right now? You say, Pastor, I don't know what the ways of the house of Saul that are left in me. Holy Spirit will reveal. Holy Spirit will show you. I think we need to reflect on that for just a moment right now before we go. Risen, would you come play for just a minute? The full restoration of remnant now is to be delivered, healed, and strengthened forward. Psalms 19, 7 through 14 says this, and it's a good way to reflect right now. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Jesus, help us now. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest of gold. They are sweeter than honey. Even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servant. A great reward for those who obey him. How can I know all the sins? Look right here. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? And this is what the remnant's cry is now. Before we take another step forward. Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock. Not, not pleasing to man. Not pleasing to a show. But may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We cannot take another step toward, toward without heeding the instruction of a good, good father tonight. I feel like this. Pastor, are you, you've not been beat up tonight. No. The good, good father is, I, I picture this, this is the vision I have. This is where I'm sitting down at the dinner table with my father. And he's saying, son, you might want to think about this. Son, look at this. Son, be instructed this way because I've been there. I've seen it all. I know what can happen. I know the road. I know the way. This is not beating you down and saying you're a bunch of sinners. No, this is a good father. And saying, listen, remnant. Listen right now. We're at the table together. And if there's anything in there, let's get it out. Because I don't want this to be delayed for you. I want to bring my glory. I want to love you. I want to be with you. I want to dine with you. I want... Oh, no more delays. 
Holy Ghost, have your way. Jesus, that name above all name, have your glory in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So what we say tonight, in this moment of third anointing, in this moment of consecration, in this moment of ready to go forward, we say, Father, come on somebody, get genuine before the Lord. Father, tonight, Father, tonight, any sins lurking in my heart. Father, tonight, any hidden faults, oh God. Oh, anything. Lord, my God, anything that Lord David forgot some stuff. Lord, anything that we've forgotten, get it out of there and let us see it. Father, we don't want to delay when we get there. Lord, we don't want to have to stop for three months while your presence stays at home at Edom's house. Have to regroup and try again. Lord, you brought us to a moment of threshing. You brought the remnant to a moment of threshing. My God, let this minister right now, let us all in this place, heed, heed, yield to you and heed to your instruction. Lord, the, the armor of Saul looked so good to David that he put it on. But Lord, it was not the ways of the house of Saul that would bring the victory over the giant in the land. It was only you. Lord, there's things in our hearts that look good to us from the house of Saul, where we were born, where we were called, where we were raised up, where we served. Lord, there's things that still look good there. Father, right now, and I pray with everything that's within me, Lord, find them in my heart and get rid of them now. Lord, overflow us now. Get rid of the lurking sins. Get rid of the hidden faults right now. That we might be open to the pure voice and the word of God. Walking only after your voice. Father, we ask it now in the name of Jesus. It is our heart's cry. It is our heart's cry this hour. Thank you, good, good Father. Somebody give God the glory. Thank you, good, good Father. You're such a good Father. You're such a good Father. You're such a good Abba. Daddy came here tonight and loved you. Daddy came here tonight and put his arm around you. I believe that with all of my heart. Oh, hallelujah. I believe that he came. He put his arm around you and said, son, he said, daughter, listen, this will help you. Let's get this little thing out of the way. Oh, how little it may be. Well, let's get it out of the way so there'll be no stumbling. There'll be no delay. Father, we give you glory in this place tonight. You alone are worthy unto you who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even imagine. Unto you be all glory forever and ever. Amen. For you are worthy of all praise tonight. We give you the glory in this place. Father, be with your people now as they go to the secret places. Father, as they go behind, Lord God, the veil and the door. Lord, as they go to their place with you, Father, I pray that you would begin to reveal. I pray that you would begin to reveal and remove sins that are lurking, hidden faults, oh God. Lord, do it in all of us now. As you prepare this way forward in you. Go with us, God. Protect us. Provide. May your body favor be upon everyone. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you so much. Don't miss Saturday night, 630. I don't know what it'll look like. I don't know what it'll be. God just said, come and worship and celebrate the season of Shabbat, the abundance of rain. So come Saturday night and you come and stay as long as you like. The doors open at 630. People will be praying. People will be dancing. People will be worshiping the Lord. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads, we are coming. He said, come and praise and worship me for what I'm fixing to do. I believe that. Come on. Come Saturday night at 630. God bless you is our prayer. We love you and we'll see you next time.